Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome um, to the first of a two-part series we're hosting in conjunction with Farmers Weekly. I will just fire on a uh, presentation. So um, this afternoon's webinar, the first one, um, is all about managing your carbon for profit. And it's great to see so many of you here um, that are able to join us, so thank you. For those that perhaps haven't heard of us um, before, Lawrence Gould are rural business consultants that have been providing financial and technical advice to farmers and landowners since the 1960s. We have five offices located um, across England and Scotland. Um, as you can see, there are five office locations. Um, and we're offering a wide variety of services, um, not just farm business management, um, including contract farming agreements, grants, subsidies, energy renewables, and environmental stewardship, uh, to name a few. More recently, we've developed an in-house uh, carbon team who provides our carbon auditing service and strategy development to assist with your carbon journey, who we will hear from some of that team today. Part of the reason why we're here um, is part of the um, Future Farm Resilience Fund, which Lawrence School Partnership have been appointed by DEFRA. And under that scheme, um, we're able to provide a number of free services as I said, webinars today, which focus on topical issues surrounding the industry. One, one farm visits, um, which is more focused and personal to issues that um, you may be facing and um, provide a review of your business. And lastly, and while we're all here today, is for the uh, free carbon audit service. Um, so if you wish to sign up for any of those, then please do email newmarket at lawrencegould.com and our um, in-house team, Cheryl, will, will set you up with that. And just to iterate that point, really, as, as many of you will be aware, with the declining BPS payments um, and as the stage environmental land management schemes come into play, um, it's, it's important to, to have a look into these, these new um, opportunities. So as I mentioned before, grant funding. Now um, there's a number of grants available. Um, the FETF, which got announced today, there's another round of that with a higher grant range coming in up to £50,000. Um, the improving farm productivity for robotics and automation is now live. Um, and under that also the solar grant, which we've done a number of applications for. The slurry grant, water management grant, adding value grant and are all now closed, but we expect to see another round open at some point, hopefully this year. Um, so if you are thinking of any projects, um, please do get in touch. So carbon. Um, as many of you be aware, the UK's targets to come net zero by 2050. Um, and many industry bodies and retailers encouraging this and bringing that forward to 2030. Uh, including the likes of Morrison's, you can see down the bottom there on the left. Um, and also encouraged by things like the WWF basket incentives. The role of carbon with our, our culture will only hold great significance um, the further down the line we go. Um, so getting on board with this early will definitely help unlock um, potential income streams. And again, reported by DEFRA, they're keen to harmonise this process um, and, and Lawrence Gould are keeping ahead of that and, and making sure we're in line um, to help with that. So part of that process, um, as I mentioned before, is the carbon auditing, uh, which Kerry from our Dunfermline office will talk you through. We're also joined by Susan Gregory from Agrasta, who is the CEO. Um, and she will discuss with you low carbon produce opportunities. And finally, to wrap things up, Ian Thompson, who's Associate Director at Dunfermline and also our carbon lead, um, will talk you through key considerations. 
If you do have any questions as we go along, um, you'll find the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, we will be running one or two polls as we go through. Um, so please, if you can participate in those, that'd be greatly appreciated. And again, this webinar will be recorded. Um, so if you do want to watch back, you can request and it will be available on demand. Um, that's enough for me. I will hand over to Kerry to talk you through the carbon auditing. Perfect. Thank you, Marcus. I will just start by sharing my screen. There we go. Hopefully everyone can now see a presentation up on the screen. So my part tonight is to be looking through what do you get from a carbon audit? So we're going to look at tonight what is a carbon audit? What does a carbon audit tell you? And then we're also going to look at some of the measures being taken to standardise carbon audits and then what you can get from your overall carbon audit. So firstly, what is a carbon audit? I'm sure it's a phrase that many of you have heard before. So a carbon audit basically takes the data from your farm, we put it through a carbon calculator, and then this then gives you your greenhouse gas emissions. So these are given to you by gas, and then they are all standardised in carbon dioxide equivalents. So you'll see this throughout our presentation tonight. CO2E, which stands for carbon dioxide equivalents. We also take into account the carbon stock change within the soil. So again, this is something you'll hear us talk about a lot tonight. Examples of carbon auditing tools are AgriCalc, Farm Carbon Toolkit, and the Cool Farm Tool. All the outputs you'll see from Ian and I tonight are all from AgriCalc, um, as this is the carbon audit we use ourselves within Lawrence Gould. So when you get your carbon audit, what is the first thing you see? The first thing you see is your whole farm figure, which will be tonnes of CO2 equivalents emitted or sequestered at farm level. So this headline figure will tell you whether you're an emitter, whether you're nearly at net zero, or whether you're a sequester. Why are these figures important? If you're a high emitter, this may mean your system is not going to be sustainable going forward. And if you're a high sequester, this could give the ability to monetize your sequestration and provide an alternative income to your farm. Do you emit or sequester is our first thing we're going to look at. This is your headline figure. So we've got three example farms here. The farm on the right at the top is two thirds of the size, but the nest emissions are only 30% of the farm on the left, therefore indicating this is a far more efficient farm. These are both arable units, so both growing very similar crops. One is simply more efficient than the other. Some of the efficiencies will be due to the inputs used, and some of them will be due to the sequestration taking place. So we can see here, we've got this figure that says soil carbon flux. Soil carbon flux is the process of carbon being added or removed from the soil. On arable systems, this can be through the use of tillage practice or clover within the rotation. And then in livestock, this can be down to grazing regime, land use change, how long the grass has been on the land, etc. Our bottom graph shows a 40 hectare, very extensive out livestock unit. As you can see, the soil carbon flux figure is a far bigger figure here. And we've also got a far bigger for our woodland and hedge sequestration. Overall, this farm is therefore a sequestrator. So where are the big emissions? Where are key areas for different farm types? For arable businesses, fertilizer and fuel are our main target areas, whereas livestock's a bit more complex. These are generally made up of a combination of enteric, enteric fermentation, byproduct emissions from, livestock, from the livestock digestion process, manure management, and also emissions from their feed that you feed into the livestock. So carbon metrics you need to know. Once we start looking into the audit, we'll see a lot of figures based on tonnes per hectare of CO2 equivalents. This allows us to look into each enterprise on an individual basis and on a land use basis, looking at it on a per hectare basis. It allows us to know where our emissions are within the business, allows us to compare these figures against other farms, 
and understand how the impact of changing our enterprises and what the impact of this can have on our overall carbon emissions. So where are the emissions? Here we've got examples of a feed wheat crop and an all-seed rape crop. Feed wheat is in orange, all-seed rape is in green. On the left, we show the emissions from these crops without soil carbon flux, compared to on the right, where we show these emissions with soil carbon flux. The changes from these two graphs, where they flipped and the wheat has gone from being higher to lower, and the all-seed rape has gone being gone from lower to higher, is due to the cultivation strategy, strategies that has been employed. So where are our emissions on farm? Here you will see we have got a range of arable, arable enterprises. So the black lines with on the graph show the average for this type of enterprise. So in the yellow, we've got feed wheat and the black line is our average. Our other graph shows our different areas that are used on our farm for each of these enterprises. Again, we can see our feed wheat is significantly more than our next biggest enterprise, our molten spring barley. If you're looking for easy wins in your business and where you can make the biggest difference the quickest, you should focus on the one that has got, first of all, the biggest land use area. And in this case, the feed wheat is also the one that has got the biggest ability to change to get it down to average to make a difference on farm. For reference, arable crops average about three tonnes per hectare in terms of emissions. And these can tend to range anywhere between one and five tonnes per hectare depending on efficiency and practice. Another common carbon metric that we use when comparing against benchmarks or other farmers is kilograms of CO2, CO2 equivalents per kilogram of output. So this can be per kilogram of beef, per kilogram of milk, per kilogram of grain. And emissions for each emission source can also be seen. So this can give you fertilizer use per kilogram of grain produced. A really useful figure to know and be able to compare about. So we then tend to look how you compare your farm compares against others. So here we've got two milling wheat enterprises. The two milling wheat examples here, the top producer is a higher than average carbon footprint per kilogram of grain produced, while the bottom, bottom graph shows a lower than average footprint. The main differences between these producers are their fuel and fertilizer use efficiency. And this is for arable, and this is the biggest areas and where we tend to focus. So to allow you to see the difference that an improvement can make, we use this clever little ta table. So the top graph here relates to the previous graph on the previous slide. So the poor performer has lots of scope to improve emissions over the whole farm. Improving fertilizer efficiency on the wheat crop alone, again, to reduce it down to the benchmark figures, will improve the overall farm efficiency, re reduces the overall farm emissions by 13.5%, a hugely significant figure if you're trying to lower your footprint. The bottom foot footprint was, of course, far more efficient than the benchmark. Just because we have not shown any areas where improvements can be made here against the benchmark does not mean there's no improvements that can be made on farm in terms of other efficiencies. This graph again demonstrates how the yield and the inputs can have a huge impact. Efficiency is key and we are all aware of that. The top set of charts show a milling wheat crop with high inputs that tend to lead that with the high yield and the low, sorry, the top graph shows a higher than average yield and lower than average inputs, as can be seen. The yield as a percentage of benchmark is 104%. Therefore, they've got higher yield. We would therefore expect our carbon emissions to be explained slightly by the difference. We'd expect them to be slightly lower. Whereas the orange chart here, orange bar here shows how much more significantly efficient they are compared to the benchmark at only 56%. The bottom graph shows the poorer performer. We've got a lower than average yield. We would expect their carbon emissions to be slightly higher therefore, but here you can see their emissions are nearly double what we would expect them to be. This therefore shows there's huge improvements that can be made in terms of efficiency, likely fertilizer and fuel efficiency. 
one thing we are being asked about is how do you measure it? Carbon is incredibly complex and it's a hugely fast moving sector. We are still in the early development years and yeah, there are definitely improvements to be made. DEFRA in January 24 released their HARC audit harmonization report. This is where they independently looked at a range of carbon audit, audit tools used commonly on farm. There are differences within all of them due to the me methodology employed, the complexity of the data requested, and then the granularity of the data included. It is key to note that all the tools are improving constantly. They're all on constant update cycles as new science comes out and as they incorporate them into their tools. Accuracy is very dependent on the level of detail involved and at which level this data can be entered. Again, this comes back to the granu granularity of the data. The benefit gained of including a lot of data will often outweigh the cost of collecting all this data and then inputting it. This is also included in what is included in the audit and the level of the granularity of data here. Fertilizer can have a huge impact on our carbon footprint, as we have seen. So the flexibility to assess fertilizers from different sources should therefore be key. The carbon footprint of a fertilizer produced in this country, to say Ukraine, to Spain, will all have a different carbon footprint. Feed, particularly soya, has the same issue. Soya produced in South America, where you've also got to take into account the land use change, will have a higher carbon footprint than that produced in Europe. Livestock are also far more complex than crops, um, purely because we have so many different livestock systems, um, different grazing methods and different manure management systems, which all make predicting the accuracy of these far harder. So what can we get from our carbon audit and what is the principle and the direction of travel? All our audits prove that output drives efficiency. Output is also key in our financial efficiency and it is therefore worth doing a carbon audit to prove both of these points. For arable, fertilizer is our biggest emission sector by far and therefore where the biggest gains can generally be made. Livestock is more complex we have got to take in reproductive efficiency into account, our feed source, feeding methods, our grazing systems and stocking rates, as well as our manure management for each class of livestock. We do know that reducing our energy consumption and moving towards renewables is key for all farms. And the only way we're be going to be able to manage by, is by measurement. Before we do anything, we need a benchmark and a starting point, hence why carrying out a carbon audit now is key. What can we get from a carbon audit? We can gain an insight into the direction strategy, but not overall verification of what we should do. We have got the potential to access new income streams. We have got the potential to save money by using fewer outputs from the same, fewer inputs for the same output, helping to our lower emissions and improve our profit for the farm. We can help move towards a regen farming practice and show, show the measures that regen farming and how this has an impact on our carbon footprint. We can help reduce the impact on the environment, climate change and help inc increase biodiversity. And this can also help prepare us for carbon taxes, which Ian will touch on for later on, which are definitely coming. If you have any questions at all from tonight's presentation, please do not hesitate to get in touch with any of ourselves at Lawrence Gould or Susan at Grasta. Before I hand over to Susan, I will now stop sharing and share our first poll of the evening. So our first poll of the evening is how have you already completed a carbon audit or are you interested in a carbon audit? Our three answers are, have, I have already completed one, I am interested in a carbon audit and I have no plans to complete a carbon audit. If you could please fill in your answers now, that would be brilliant.
Right. Thank you for that. I will now pass on over to Susan from Agrasta for the evening. Thank you very much, Kerry. I'll just share my screen and bear with me. Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. Um, I'm here to talk to you all about uh, earning a premium from low carbon produce. So without further ado, um, who is Agresta? I'm sure you're saying, well, we connect to net zero targeted food businesses who are willing to pay a premium to farmers of audited low carbon produce. We're a new business. So this is all quite a new area of the market and it's, uh, it's incredibly popular. But I'm going to ask you just for a second to change seats uh, and imagine that you are working in a restaurant. So most restaurants have committed to net zero targets by 2030. Their carbon footprint is made up of three different groups. First one is direct emissions, basically the ones that they use for cooking, heating, et cetera, in a restaurant. Second uh, area is about indirect emissions. So basically how those, how, how that electricity has been, or gas has been generated. You don't really need to worry about those. It's the third area that's really key. So in terms of their upstream emissions, they're around 90%. And those are basically the ingredients that are bought in um from to use as you know to serve as it, within the restaurant it does also incorporate waste but the predominant area is is upstream and that's a big issue they often in terms of when they do their footprints they're often using averaged um uh, data which is actually often overestimated because they don't have access to farm level data now it's incredibly hard for restaurants to impact these upstream emissions now from a buyer perspective they have, um, there, there is ultimately insufficient low carbon produce for everyone to hit their net zero targets. Very rarely do they have access to supplier farms. And as I mentioned before, they're using inaccurate data. From a farmer perspective, it's clear that actually moving to new practices can be very risky. And the key thing for farmers is that there is a missing financial incentive for low carbon produce, which is an issue. So now imagine that you work for a restaurant group where your emissions are, are up in the upstream supply chain. What do you do? Do you remove top selling steak or burgers from the menu and basically commit financial suicide? Do you miss your net zero targets and risk a backlash? Do you buy offsets or do you call a grasta and start sourcing low carbon produce at a small premium from responsible farms? Now, what we do, we use the absolute figures that, that come through from your existing farm audits. And just to give an example, um, we've got here, so a farm audit shows that there's emissions of 2,000 tonnes CO2e, farmers producing 100 tonnes of beef. Well, then the restaurant is buying beef at 20 kilos of CO2e per kilo of beef. It, it's very simplistic, and I know that is incredibly simplistic, but it makes it easier to explain. It's very transparent. We're using accurate data, not estimates. It's lower risk than offsets, and it has an immediate impact rather than putting in a five-year decarbonisation project. It helps everyone meet net zero targets, and it rewards farmers with a financial premium, which is what we said is missing. Um, and that's important. Um, what do we look to achieve? Usually around 10 to 15% premium. Um, it does vary according to the, the, um, uh, the amount of emissions with the produce and some other factors as well, but roughly it's about that. Now, we have many opportunities in the pipeline. Uh, just to just sort of uh, bring some examples here today, there are two um, on the go. One, which is uh, we are looking for uh, um, 10 tonnes of Scottish beef. Um, to supply um, a Scottish restaurant chain. Uh, and we're also looking for 100 tonnes uh, of lamb shoulder um, to supply a UK-based um, restaurant chain. Um, and that needs to be at no more than 27.43 tonnes of CO2 per tonne, very specific. 
Now, to do that, um, to, to be um, eligible for this, you will need a recent audit. Um, I've put a little asterisk there because I've just put, just to point out, these audits are going to start becoming a license to trade. Food businesses are all starting to actually specify it or stipulate that they this is what is needed because they're so desperate for this information. So it's good to get going now. On top of that audit, you may also need third party verification. Um, you might also need um, um, a, a, some history to show what you've achieved over previous audits to show that progress. They might ask you for Regen Ag examples and they'll probably ask you for things like BRC or Red Tractor certification. Now, our current focus is on livestock, but actually there's demand for all sorts of different produce. Uh, when I speak to restaurant groups, they're basically saying everything. But their key issue at the moment is, is basically beef and lamb. Um, and we are looking for interested farmers um, to contact us. Uh, Kerry's just given you my email address, but otherwise, if you want to look at the uh, website, please do. Um, that's www.agrasta.com. Thank you very much. Um, and I will be handing over to Marcus. Perfect. Thank you, Susan. Um, again, just following those two whistle stop presentations. I know there's a lot of information to take in there. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, please do pop them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, just time now for our second poll. Uh, we've got a series of questions actually. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just spending uh, a minute or two answering these. Um, so I will put them on now. Uh, so it should be, have you considered low, selling low carbon produce? Yes or no? Okay, and next poll. Um, Have you considered carbon certificates or credits? Yes or no? And have you considered woodland credits? Yes or no? And final one, are you interested in generating income from carbon markets at all? Yes, no, or not yet. Brilliant. Thank you for answering those. Um, I shall now hand over to Ian, who will probably talk you through the um, practical implications of actually putting that into practice and the considerations you'll need for your farm. Good evening, everybody. I uh, hope everybody can see my screen. Um, so as Marcus says, I'm just going to try and add a little bit of uh, detail around what we've talked on already and pick up some of the themes. So um, going to quickly um, talk about what's happening elsewhere across Europe and the UK, a um, little bit about carbon taxes, um, talk you through where the income streams are possible and how you can reduce your costs, um, talk about carbon stocks, uh, whether you should build them, grassland sequestration, does it actually sequestrate? That's always a topical uh, subject. How we set a carbon strategy and then finish with some quick rules of thumb uh, 
overview of the values associated with carbon and some take home messages. So what's happening in Europe um, under the latest round of the CAP over there, um, farms are required to carry out beneficial crop rotations over most of the arable land, 4% of the arable land, they have to do something other than farm that helps the climate or the environment. Well, they've still got the eco schemes funded through Pillar 2, which everybody will be familiar with. And essentially 35% of the rural development budget has to support the environment, climate or welfare. Uh, there's targets to half pesticide and reduce fertilizer by 20% by 2030. And interestingly, and something I didn't learn until recently, uh, they are looking specifically at cap and trade scheme, uh, specifically for farm emissions. Elsewhere in the UK, um, in Northern Ireland, um, Northern Irish have decided to essentially sample every field in Northern Ireland for soil carbon by the end of 2026, and also assess uh, or scan the hedges in woodland to measure carbon stocks. And there's a £45 million budget for that, so quite a large expense. In Scotland, um, uh, going forward, there'll be a whole farm plan, which includes carbon audits, biodiversity audits, soil testing, animal health. And again, in Wales, very similar, a sustainability review, including carbon assessment and habitat baseline review. So my point is, is that um, whether you're in Europe or in the UK, uh, this is going to be uh, something we're going to have to deal with and get to grips with. So are carbon taxes coming, the stick? Uh, well, it might surprise you to learn that UK and EU emissions trading scheme, that's what the ETS stands for, has operated since 2005 for aviation and large energy users. And that's effectively uh, a tax on the, on the high emitters in those sectors. I've already said that there's a cap and trade scheme being looked at specifically for farm emissions so that may well come in and that's essentially what that uk and eu emissions trading scheme is it it penalizes those who are um higher emitters and rewards those who are uh, lower emitters in um back in december uh, the uk government um announced that they're going to introduce a carbon levy on imports by 2027 um so that is effectively a tax on in on imports and so whether it's quite right to call them penalties um, or not I think is uh, a point of language but there will be a higher costs associated with not managing your carbon emissions so the point here is is that you don't have to be at the front of the queue but you really don't want to be at the back of the queue and as the graphic on the, on the right screen shows um, you just have to move a little bit faster uh, than your competition So looking at the various income streams, we've already heard from Susan about premium on low carbon produce. Um, there are becoming more and more entrants into that market. So I believe that ADM uh, uh, have got a scheme which rewards farmers uh, for low carbon produce. Um, Simpsons Malt um, uh, are rewarding farmers who are able to grow um, low carbon produce and are actually helping them by uh, subsidizing low carbon fertilizer and in a way it's very similar that I guess to uh, what we've done for many years which has been rewarded for low nitrogen uh, barley. Um, I'm going to focus more on uh, carbon certificates and uh, the SFI scheme just a, a little bit and then but there are other areas to bear in mind so there are incentives to change practices. So for example, the Woodland Trust can help you plant trees and hedges. Um, and one that uh, you may not be aware of is, is that some banks are offering reduced bank fees or completely waiving arrangement fees if they can see that the project they're helping you support or finance uh, will lead to reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And we have helped somebody with that already. So moving on to carbon certificates or carbon offsets. Um, well, this market is really dominated by woodland and to a lesser extent peatland. The, there are two well-established carbon codes uh, which the market understands. Um, and the other area is really in um, soil sequestration and rewarding people for reducing emissions or, or building um, carbon in soils. And there's just um, three examples of companies doing that. There are more. 
So what is a carbon certificate or an offset? Essentially, it's a verified certificate that demonstrates reduced greenhouse gas emissions or sequestration equivalent to one tonne of CO2 equivalents. How do they work? Well, as I've said, often they're associated with woodland, peatland restoration, um, or changes in arable farming practice. Um, those are reduced cultivations, rotational changes, use of cover crops. Uh, what are the pros? Um, the, the pros are that you get paid potentially 20 to 25 pounds a tonne for the carbon that you can demonstrate you've either emitted, sorry, uh, you've reduced the emissions of or sequestered. And that works out to a maximum, and that is quite difficult to achieve, that of about 60 pounds a hectare. But they also concentrate the mind on reducing emissions. The cons are that you have contractual obligations. You may need the offsets for your own business or your own supply chain. And if you've um, let somebody else have control of them, that, that may not be a good thing. Um, and I think as well, at the moment, there's not an awful lot of research on the impact of regen farming and the levels of carbon sequestration and, and, and where the benefits of that are. So I think we're at the, the very early stages uh, and, and some of those benefits will be proven in time. Um, so these um, carbon certificates or offsets are accessed through schemes usually operated by the companies I mentioned on the previous scheme. I think it's important to understand what we mean by verification. And essentially verification is, is the, 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 um, the methodology or, or the, the process around how these carbon offsets or carbon certificates are, are verified. And essentially the, the, the higher the level of verification or the more robust the process, then the higher the payment. But by the same token, that also means that the tighter the straitjacket, which is around what you do. And, and the practices you have on farm. So a good example of that might be one scheme might say, well, we prefer if you were direct drilling or doing min till, but we don't mind if you plow the odd field because we understand there are times when that's important. Other schemes, they just will not allow you to do that. And that changes the value. Um, I think the other point to note is that the value increases if, if the carbon is measured rather than inferred. So if you are measuring my soil analysis and you can demonstrate that that that, that carbon that's been sequestered is tangible it's there it'll be worth more um, and I th another practice will be remote sensing using satellites and and that may not be as robust so hence the reason why I think Northern Ireland has chosen the route they've chosen you also need to bear in mind that to comply with scheme rules you need to show additionality and that means you've got to demonstrate that you would not follow the practice without the carbon payment and there's quite a bit of debate as to whether that you know, somebody who's been direct drilling for years where they can access some of these payments. And, and I think they probably can, probably should, but it is an area for debate and that may change. So just to sum up, there's large variations in methodology and therefore value associated with the carbon certificates. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the sustainable farming incentive. Um, not a huge amount. Uh, if you're looking for detail on this on this scheme, then I suggest you uh, tune into our webinar next week, which goes through the SFI in detail. The point I'm making here is, is that the aims of the scheme are to support the transition to net zero um, and to replace lost biodiversity and habitats. If you look at the 2023 handbook, 19 of the 23 SFI prescriptions will either reduce your carbon emissions or increase sequestration. And so what I'm getting at here is, is that if you're thinking about your carbon footprint, I would encourage you to look hard at the SFI measures because they will help you um, reduce your carbon footprint. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing because um, if you're going to set a carbon strategy for your business, then that may well change your view on which SFI measures you uh, look at. So I encourage you to look at both hand in hand. want to talk a little bit about um, measuring carbon stocks because as I already alluded to if you can measure something uh, you will get paid more for it. There's a bit of an issue at the moment here because um, there are different views on what constitutes a robust measurement of soil carbon. How many samples do you take per hectare? How many samples do you need to take if there's a variation in soil type? How deep do you need to take the samples? Is it in the top 15, 30 or perhaps down to a meter? 
Um, and within that vertical soil profile, how many samples do you need to take across that vertical profile? So it's quite a lot of variation. Um, and the costs of doing that are between 35 and 60 pounds per hectare. But it's not just that cost. You've got to do that at the start and the end so you can demonstrate how much carbon has been sequestered. Um, to see a return at current carbon values, you probably need to be sequestering a ton annually. And that broadly gets you to the cost of the um, carbon or the cost of doing the soil analysis at the most expensive level. So is it worth it? Well, I suppose it all hinges on what the carbon might be worth in the future. And if it's worth potentially £50 a tonne, then it may well be. And, and so that's the, the point I'm making between the robustness of the verification process and the value of the carbon. Um, if you look at it from the other viewpoint and you were to use something that, that um, uh, such as remote sensing, uh, which can help to model carbon sequestration in soil, um, clearly that estimate isn't going to be worth as much as a measurement. But if it's reasonably accurate and depending on cost, there might be more margin there despite a low carbon price because it's cheaper to get the measurement. Quick look at grassland sequ sequestration. So um, that's always a topical issue, this. And the way I view this, I really break it down into three parts. So it's how productive is the grass, um, both from an agricultural point of view, I guess, and also from a carbon point of view. So, so what's happening in the soil, how much of that grassland is, is producing organic matter in the soil. And what feeds into that is, is how much fertilizer is used, how old is the grass, what's the rotation, how much clothes in the soil, sward, sorry, what's in the pH, is it herbal lay, for example. And then the other thing you've got to think about is, is how close to equilibrium are your soils. So any soil will only hold so much carbon. And if you're sequestrating year on year, then over a period of years, you'll get closer, closer to that equilibrium point and you probably see a tail off in the sequestration that's been um, um, made. So you've got an amount of sequestration that's taking place in the soil. Uh, we then look at the impact of the livestock. And the way I think about this is fairly simply is if you've got a small number of livestock in a productive grass field, then you're going to be um, sequestering carbon. If you've got a, a much more intensive system where there's a lot of livestock relative to the area of, of grassland then it's probably likely you're going to be emitting carbon and the carbon audit will give you some view on that and of course so we've got um stocking density that's important there but also grazing regime how often the grass is is grazed and and and, and uh, the type of system used there and i think this will improve and become more accurate as the calculators evolve so managing your costs, I'm just going to run through, as I go through some of these sections, some of the slides you've already seen from Kerry, um, because I think they're, they're relevant to what we're talking about. So the starting point is know how efficient you are. And um, one of the things that we see in the arable sec sector particularly is, is that we see people who are getting, um, the yield is being limited, but they're chasing yield by putting on a lot of inputs and sometimes half as much or, or almost doubling carbon terms as other people. And so I think you've got to be realistic about what your farm can generate in terms of output and understand what's limiting you, because it may not be fertilizer, it may be something else, it may be drainage, it may be soil type, uh, uh, soil quality, so on and so, on, so forth. Uh, uh, we are starting to see now, as I alluded to earlier, low carbon inputs. Um, at the moment, these are fertilizers and fuels. Uh, you can see in the bottom right hand corner a chart there that shows the relative kilos of CO2 uh, per hectare from traditional fertilizers in the blue compared to with some um, new fertilizer products. The problem with these is that they're very expensive. So you're getting very low carbon, but it's costing you two or three times um, for the same nitrogen rate in, uh, in terms of fertilizer cost and fuel uh, is about um, 85 pence a litre more expensive using these low carbon fuels, which um, I'm not sure if anybody's aware, but the supermarkets are using almost exclusively now, which is why haulage costs have gone up. Um, so 
I'm not necessarily advocating using these unless you've got a significant premium or significant reason to do so. But I think where they could be really useful is if you were trying to get to a um, emissions target, possibly to get to a, a premium with a graster, um, then if you're just on the wrong side of it and you use one of these um, low carbon fertilizers or fuels, then for a relatively modest cost, you might be able to get a, a potential premium, which would change things. So setting a carbon strategy, how do we set a carbon strategy for your business? Well, the first thing is to be clear about your objectives. Why are you doing this? Do you want to reduce your emissions? Do you want to build carbon stocks on your farm and improve soils? Do you want to generate new income? Is it a mix of all three? But of course, the one which I've not put up here is profit. Whatever we do, we have to at least maintain current profitability or enhance profitability. So we've got to test our strategy against how we uh, against our business profitability and hopefully improve on that. So, um, what do I mean when I say set a carbon strategy? Let's really understand where you are so we can define where we can get to. And again, I'm looking at two slides you saw earlier where we have um, the inefficient arable farmer and the uh, more efficient arable farmer. And it may just be as simple as moving from one position to the other. And um, in this particular example, it would mean um, moving from, um, you know, um, probably saving two, three, 400 tonnes of carbon uh, on an annual basis. So the first thing to do is complete a carbon audit, understand where your business is and um, what's relevant for your business. Are you, as uh, the charts on the top here, uh, emitting carbon from the soil or are you, as the farmer is at the bottom, sequestering carbon in the soil? That's a big change there. Um, and work out which parts of your business uh, there is more mileage in making gains. And uh, Kerry went through some of that earlier. Um, so from that, if you understand where the emissions are in your business, you can work out what changes you need to make. I think um, for those of you in England, using the SFI makes an awful lot of sense because you can get paid for uh, some of the things you may need to do. Um, and once you've got a strategy and where you want to change your business, then you can then bring the audit back, model those changes without changing anything you do on farm and say, this is what's likely to happen. And will that meet your objectives? Um, if you're happy with that strategy, um, you can then implement it, make the decision and go for it. And at the same time, you can start looking for premium for your produce um, and hopefully get paid for um, having a more valuable commodity and um, again, see what impact that has on the financial aspects of business. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, what you want to do is look at how you monetize your carbon assets where appropriate. And what I'm talking about there is really the, the carbon offsetting schemes, because it may be that they're appropriate for you, it may not be, but if you're a big sequesterer, the relative risks are lower and we're then on to whether or not you can pull income from these different sources from um, the SFI, uh, from um, uh, carbon premia uh, in some cases, and whether you can still qualify or benefit from some of the carbon offsetting schemes and if they suit you and, and, and pull some of that together. And of course, that's when it starts to be more meaningful. So I'm just going to look at some quick rules of thumb for you when we're talking about carbon and some of the metrics we're finding. So cereal and all seed rape crops emit between one and five tonnes per hectare, average three tonnes per hectare, um, including grass in the rotation, sequesters, you know, somewhere in the region of 0.7 tonnes per hectare. Of course, how much grass and over what period will change that. Including cover crops will increase sequestration by around about a tonne per hectare if they're established early and grow well. Legumes in the rotation have about a third of the emissions of cereals and all-seed rape, so about two tonnes per hectare less CO2 equivalents on average. And just to put that in context, if you were to plant woodland on arable land, and I'm not suggesting for a minute you should, I'm just saying if you did, then you would lose the three or four tonnes per hectare of emissions and you would 
sequester nine or 10 tons per hectare in timber a year. So that's a swing of 13 tons per hectare. And it just really emphasizes the point that what you do with your land has a huge impact on your um, uh, carbon footprint. Just want to quickly go over some of the values so that um, it's helpful for anybody wanting to understand. So Woodland Carbon Code, it's really two parts. This one is, is um, PIUs, which effectively estimated carbon. And you plant your wood, um, somebody has a look and says, this is likely how much carbon it's going to generate. And then after five years, you measure it. And another five years, you measure it again. And once those um, promissory units or estimated units are changed into actual um, woodland carbon units through measurement, the value goes up by about £10 a tonne. So from £25 to £35 a tonne. Um, Peatland Code is the same range, £20 to £30 a tonne. Uh, Units with high levels of verification um, are trading at around $50, which is about £40. And those are the sorts of things you hear large companies like Microsoft. So there's been deals done in, in um, Australia at that level, for example. I think you also have to be mindful of, of adding value through biodiversity. And this really is more of an opportunity in upland and hill farms. So where you might be doing some uh, woodland planting and also um, changing grazing patterns and increasing biodiversity, then potentially that those carbon units can be worth substantially more, potentially 50 to 60 pounds per unit. If we look at the, the values of the soil carbon, as I've already said, if through the um, uh, offsetting schemes there, 20 to 25 pounds a tonne, and if you're ticking all the boxes, it's potential to get 60 pounds a hectare. Um, I think it's important we understand the context of that. So that's 60 pounds a hectare is equivalent to a third of a tonne of wheat. And, you know, eight tonnes a hectare, that's about three to five percent of your income. Um, just for reference, EU and UK emissions trading schemes are worth, they have been worth between 15 and 90 pounds a tonne in the last three to four years, probably about 50 to 60 pounds a tonne today. Um, they've recently dropped in value. I think it'd be reasonable to expect them to go back up over time. And you could also argue that if we become, um, uh, I, I guess, if there are some form of um, uh, emissions reduction schemes that supply to agriculture, then these carbon values could likely increase to more in line with the current emissions trading scheme values. And then just as a uh, to compare, you know, if you're getting a, a say, a 10 percent carbon premium on a, a low carbon wheat crop and it's eight tons per hectare, at 180 pounds a ton, that's worth 144 pounds a hectare. And I think that's interesting uh, when compared with that 60 pounds a hectare from soil carbon schemes. So finally, just a quick look at some uh, take homes. I think every farm is different and has different opportunities. Um, and so in order to understand what those opportunities are, you have to understand your farm. And the best way to do that is to do a carbon audit. Efficiency reduces your emissions and is always a good thing. So good farming helps. Um, renewable projects always help as well. So where you are replacing um, fossil fuel or fossil fuel energy with on-farm renewables, that will directly impact your carbon footprint, provided you're using the energy on farm. Uh, Low carbon inputs are available, but they can be pricey. So you've got to make sure they work for you. How you use your land is key. What you grow on it, what your rotation is, how you change it, how much is in production. Do offsets work for me? Well, they could do, depending on your situation, whether you feel they're right for you. And part of making that decision is that informed decisions are better decisions. And so understanding um, uh, I guess the complexity around this or speaking to somebody and getting some advice will help you. Um, and then um, looking at the impact on profit alongside this, alongside your carbon audit is really important and making sure that you're enhancing profitability and not um, doing something which isn't going to take your business forward. So as I've said already, um, a carbon audit is the first step um, we're delivering carbon audits for free under the FFRF at the moment. 
and alongside the one-to-one -one business advice. So please, um, if you want to talk to somebody, uh, call Newmarket or email Newmarket on the numbers there. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, and it's probably worth noting as well under that free service that runs up until March 25. Uh, so essentially, we've got a year to deliver that service. Um, so yeah, make the most of it while you can, I think is probably the long and short of it. Um, just before we uh, head to our um, Q&A session, we'll just run through um, the poll results. Um, so if we have a look at the poll one, uh, have you completed the car carbon audit? 50% um, are interested with 27% um, already had one done and equally some that aren't having plans at all. So yeah, real mix there. Uh, question two, have you considered selling low carbon produce? 36% um, of those said yes, um, and 63% said no, um, which is quite interesting. Perhaps um, a new market to explore there. Um, and have you considered carbon certificates, credits, uh, exact 50-50 split, yes and no? Um, yeah, a lot of people potentially sat on the fence with that one, um, whether or not it's too early to start looking into that, um, potentially. And have you considered woodland credits? Um, again, a lot smaller proportion there with 34% saying yes and 65% no. And are you interested in gener generating income from carbon markets? 70% um, of you said yes. Um, so hopefully that's generated some food for thought. Um, and again, as Ian says, uh, first step to um, to strategizing carbon and seeing where you are is, is, is getting your baseline and that's your carbon audit. So um, yeah, perfect. Thank you for, your speak for speaking tonight. Um, so Q... And A, um, we've had some questions come in before, so we'll just run through those um, quickly. Probably a question for you here, Ian. Um, does a carbon credit have an unlimited shelf life um, that can be saved to be traded at some time in the future? Well, I hesitate to say something is ever unlimited, um, but once you've got the certificate, in theory, yes. So you can hold it for use against your business. Um, the point I would make is it may have... Um, it will only have a use for as long as somebody is prepared to pay something for it. And so you want to consider when you think it is going to uh, have most value. And I would suggest think of it in terms of when are um, carbon audit, uh, or sorry, uh, targets to reach net zero are, which is you know, 2040, 2050. Um, so I think it's important in that context. Uh, the other thing um, is, and if we're talking about soil there, you know, there's only a finite period when you're going to build up the carbon in your soil and so um, what's going to happen is we all build up the carbon in our soils as we're expected to do uh, so think about the timing of that and when you want to use go through that process and when those carbon certificates will have most value perfect thank you um again another one here for you ian um Will the ag algorithm for measuring carbon storage affect the good work that some grazing systems can do for sequestration? And again, I think you probably touched on that a bit in your presentation. It, yes, in short. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I said, I think that is, it, it is a complex system and the people who are... Um, developing the audit tools, they're all aware that they um, um, that they can, um, this is an area that needs more work, more research, and to get better and more accurate results that are more reliable, because I think that's a, an important point. Yeah. 
Okay, one for you, Susan. Um, and that is, would a carbon audit, um, as we've described, be sufficient proof of emissions of produce for use by yourselves uh, for selling low carbon produce? Uh, it's an entry level requirement. I would respond to that one. Um, it, and the, it's, it depends. So um, a lot of restaurant groups are asking for, they might ask for additional, um, additional sort of extras. So for example, they might say, you know, has it been, has, has the audit been undertaken by the farmer himself or has it been done by a third party? What verification um, has been undertaken? Um, they might ask uh, for specific region ag practices, which, um, you know, some of them are particularly keen on, on the region ag word, um, but um, they might also ask for some certifications they might ask for um they might ask for a, a, a minimum level of of uh, co2e per, per ton or per kilo you know I, the list goes on so basically if, if you have done a carbon audit what i would say is that's your entry level register with us because we're still early days and you know everybody's kind of working their way through this and actually we can go from there they're all different everybody's asking for different things but they all need an audit. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, slightly long question here. Uh, on the carbon audit, um, you take into account whether an emission falls into scope one, two, or three, and what impact does that then have on the overall amount of carbon emissions associated with that business? Um, so... I all of the audits have defined methodology and they will uh, generally take into uh, account scope one and scope two and for something like fertilizer they will make estimates of what the um, upstream emissions and also downstream emissions are so all of that is built in to um, the audit process okay um and on manure livestock uh, enterprises, does this include methane and nitrous oxide emissions from livestock manure storage and spreading and fertilizer spreading also in that? Yes, it does. So um, the CO2 equivalent is basically a mix of, it takes into account carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. So all these are included and they're presented in CO2 equivalents because of the differences they have in terms of global warming potential and how bad they are basically for the environment. So yes, they are all taken into account. Brilliant, thank you, Kerry. Um, is there a minimum livestock farm size that is practical to work with, or is there a way smaller farms could group together? Um, I suppose from a carbon auditing perspective, how do you view that, Ian? Um, well, what I would say is I think collaboration um, amongst farmers is really important in this space because I think if um, they want to get the maximum value out of um, their produce and specifically from carbon or low carbon produce and also um, enhanced biodiversity then collaboration to ensure that um, a realistic price is set in the marketplace is really important I think that's a huge factor um, I think Susan's probably better equipped to answer the question on individual scale of business. Uh, I'm going to say it varies again. I mean, you, you just, to, you know, the two examples that we've showed, um, one was um, looking for 10 tonnes a year of um, specific beef cuts, um, but 10 tonnes over a year isn't huge. Um, the other example was 100 tonnes of uh, a year of lamb shoulder, which is a sizable difference. So there's no, not particularly a, a minimum for us, but obviously it's, you know, we would in, we would have to, um, uh, we would have to sort of combine uh, a number of um, livestock farms together to get to, to meet some of those quantities. I think I would add to that that um, the smaller 
a farm probably has more potential to market the produce in a different way. So, um, you know, through local farm shops um, and niche markets. And if that produce comes with uh, a good carbon provenance, then I think it will be easier for that, uh, those premiums to be added. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, again, probably another one with um, a lot of the terminology that gets bounded about um, within this space, and that is to help clarify the difference between a carbon certificate and a carbon credit. Um, there is no difference. They're both the same thing, just different terminology. Uh, Another one here. Um, did you mean that supermarkets are asking the farmers, are they sourcing um, from farms uh, to be low emitting um, and therefore more expensive fertilizer? Uh, so yes, I'll... yes, in short, um, I, think, yeah. I think they are. Um, so um, the ones I talked about were, weren't really supermarkets as such, it was more, um, um, it was, um, in the cereal sector with malting barley uh, but i am aware that the supermarkets are very interested i believe some of them are looking at um low carbon fertilizer and encouraging their suppliers to use that in the in the fresh produce sector as well so yes it's there and it's coming and it will become more prevalent um any thoughts on the ability to stack carbon credits with Biodiversity net gain, BNG. This is something Ian and I were kind of talking about earlier. We were kind of talking more about the ability to use your SFI to help with your carbon efficiency. Um, in terms of carbon credits and BNG, that is something they are still looking into. It's not actually clearly written within the BNG scheme whether that will be possible or not just yet. Um, just with the double counting and some of the additionality of rules, particularly around the Woodland Carbon Scheme, that's not quite clear whether this will be possible or not yet. Okay, thank you. Um, when you have a carbon audit done, does it get reported anywhere? Um, is it confidential? Uh, so as... Um, Part of the FFRF scheme, um, I'm pretty sure we send a copy off to um, DEFRA, but it's just purely to evidence that the audit's been done. Um, I'm not convinced that they um, look at individual audits to see what an individual farm is doing. Uh, if somebody wants a confidential audit done, then we can certainly make sure that that confidentiality is respected, and we have done that in the past. Uh, question here, what does a carbon audit cost on, say, a 100 hectare farm? Um, if, again, as mentioned before, if you um, do it through the Future Farming Resilience Funds, uh, which you can sign up with us, it's completely free. Possibly um, also worth mentioning we can get free carbon audits in Scotland as well if we have got any Scottish people on the call as well. So there is ability to get funding up here as well for it. Excellent. Um, uh, uh, slightly longer question here. Do you think that zero input um, permanent grassland with extensive grazing, um, beef, cattle and sheep will be sequestering carbon or not? Any recommendations of the best carbon toolkit to use for this farming system? We are a mixed farm. Cracky, that's an interesting one. And that's uh, the one that I was uh, uh, saying was quite topical. Um, I think it's very difficult to give an answer here and now because it is so particular to the farm. But I'm going to go back to what I said in my talk, which is that the more extensive you are, the more likely that you will be sequestering carbon. Um, I, um, I don't really, I, look, all of the audit tools will cover this to a lesser or greater degree. Uh, what I'm going to say is that we use AgriCalc because we felt it dealt with the livestock sector reasonably well. And it is um, um, the way it deals with carbon sequestration is being improved at the moment. So 
I think the answer here is um, I don't see anything wrong with using something like AgriCalc. Any of the tools should give uh, a reasonable answer. The important thing is, is, is that uh, as you do an audit and then these tools improve over time, then the answer will become more accurate. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll just finish up shortly as uh, I'm aware we're um, going over the hour mark now. So um, probably just to wrap up then, uh, final question, how often uh, would a carbon audit be required? I suppose that could be a question for both you um, and Susan. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Susan? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, my gut feel would be to say an annual update. Um, the reason being is that, um, again, uh, food businesses are uh, very concerned about um, having up-to-date information that's been verified. And so the more recent the audit, the better is all I can say. So I, I think like anything else in life, the, you have to think about the costs of doing something, not an issue at the moment because it's free, uh, but that may change going forward. So if you're getting a benefit and um, the cost of providing the audit uh, is less than the benefit, then find it every year. Um, I think from a understanding where you are and understanding um, how you want to change your business um, probably every two to three years, something like that. But it can change. And I, I, you know, I just want to emphasize that the audit doesn't, or the audit tools don't just tell you what your carbon um, position is now. They can be used to say, well, this is what it might be if we change what we're doing. And that's as useful. Yeah, I think um, establishing a baseline as well um you know, no matter your circumstances or how far down the road you are is is um, is, is also very important. So, yeah. And, and actually, that's an important point, Marcus. So um, I've talked about how the um, the audit tools, that they, they will change. Um, they might change, say, how they, there might be some new science that comes out, says how much um, uh, carbon is emitted from a certain fertilizer. So they will change over time. Uh, and it's important that the tool you use will um, go back in time and change, make those updates to the historic audits so that you can see change over time on a consistent basis. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, I think we'll have to wrap up there. I appreciate there's some questions that we haven't been able to answer tonight, um, but we have got them and, and we will contact you and, and respond to those um, after this webinar. Um, so just to wrap things up, uh, thank you uh, to our speakers, Kerry, Susan and Ian um, for their presentations this evening. Thank you uh, for all of those who attended tonight um, and are listening on demand. Um, we really appreciate, appreciate you being here. Um, just uh, as a quick one, we're doing a webinar next week, uh, same setup with the Farmers Weekly uh, and that's all on sustainable farming incentive. Um, so please use the same link you used before to sign up um and i'll leave it there thank you very much good night <laughs>